So one of the things in Tanzania that comes in help in, in handy is a leader's stick. And the Maasai carry these around. Pastor Elias told me that the leader's stick, um, when the leader is happy, they, they, they hold up the small end. When they're a little upset and wanting to get their way, they hold up the, the club and the nasty end. I'm in a happy mood, so <laughs> just uh, get us going. So um, we did do our trip. Uh, this was in August, and uh, there were five of us that went along. Darla Hyam, myself, Gretchen uh, Hogsey, Pat Gardner, and Kelly Gurley over there. And someone maybe needs to go get Gretchen out of the youth room. But she wanted to tell us, us to tell her when we were ready. Maybe Dylan, could you pop in there and say we're starting the Tanzania part? Sure. Into the youth room? Right, right the other way. Um, so we're going to start off, we're trying to keep these into um, three minute reflections on some major parts. We may call upon Darla to give us uh, a reflection on Singisi. Well, one of the appropriate things about Singisi is that it starts with sing. And one of the first things you notice when you are in Tanzania and with the Singizi congregation is the amount of song. They, they sing all the time. They sang when we got to the airport. They sang when we entered the church uh, compound the first day. They sang at services. And by singing, I mean they sing. They have choreographed dances. Everything was memorized. It puts us to kind of to shame. I told them that. Um, one of the choir members one day made the statement and said, I can't preach. I can't read, but I can sing my glory to God. And that's one of the wonderful things about St. Yuzi and the, and the community of the church service there, and, and the church there. One of the other things that was really unique uh, at the church service is they have two things that I had never witnessed before, one that Chris had never witnessed before. The first one was that Members of the congregation who have prayed for something and had their prayers answered will bring a contribution to the church. And it is a full service. They will come in with their chicken or their eggs or a basket that they have, and they will present it to the church as thanksgiving for, um, for their prayers. The second service was the offering of the firstborn to the church to God's service. And this was the first time that... Uh, we had seen that, and they brought their young son up. I think he was about seven or eight years old. They also brought in chickens you know, to give to the service to the church. But it is a dedication of their eldest to the service of the Lord. Following the church service, which is probably the most unique thing, is that they have an auction. It is a fundraiser for the church. The people who bring in their eggs or their sugar cane or their chickens. or We had a calf walk into the church one day as an offering. So you know, they'll bring a cow in and do the service. They will actually do an auction afterwards, and people will hold up and say, we have two eggs, who wants to bid on these eggs? And they will bid, and it's somebody's giving to the church, and the church is raising money. Um, we gave constant <coughs> potatoes, which are the traditional wraps that they wear in Tanzania, and we gave them to the church, then we bought them at the auction, we gave them back to church members. <laughs> this year got a little bit expensive for Pastor Chris because his brother-in-law was along who kind of increased the bidding at all times. <laughs> the joy of some of the people as we gave our, our gifts back to them was just incredible. Which leads to the second thing. Hospitality in Tanzania is it's amazing. There's no way to describe how you are welcomed into their community. You are welcomed into their homes. Uh, they call it coming in for tea. Well, tea may be as simple as sodas and coffee and, and water, or tea has, can have been as elaborate as having desserts and meals. I mean, there was one day we ate six times because every tea had a full meal with it. And when they really want to celebrate, and they know that a celebratory food in the United States is called cake, they give us, they present to us a cake, which is also called nidufu. Nidufu is roasted goat. It will come in, I don't know if we have our photo of the goat yet, but uh, it will come in as a full goat, grass stuck in its mouth, it's much like a pig roast. And everyone is extremely excited, and then they present it to the guest. Chris had you know, at least five goats presented to him directly. And then the guest says, no, oh, everyone should share. And we had goats, we kept saying as we were flying out, all of the goats were going, yes, they're gone. I survived <laughs> them. <laughs> but we started talking uh, as we got together as to whether or not they put on this type of hospitality because we were there. 
And as we looked in the houses of all of the houses we visited, whether they were the houses of the ministers or the houses of some of the, the poor members of the congregation, we determined that they are welcoming to everyone because everyone has their sofas and their chairs and their living rooms are filled with seating because they want guests in their house. They are very welcoming to it. And the joy that they have to share their lives with all of us was just amazing. And with that, I will move on and let you go to part two. Um, because I have to leave, I'm doing my part a little earlier. But uh, one of the things we do on these trips is, is go and meet the, the diocese, the synod there. And you can hit the button there. Uh, one of the things we did was go, uh, one of our first days was to go to visit Bishop Akio, go to his office and bring greetings from our bishop, bring greetings from St. Matthews, all the people. It's a very formal thing. A lot of formal greetings that take place. Um, and so in, in going to visit the bishop, we also go to see diocese ministry. So um, one of the things we did right away was go to the rehabilitation center. You can hit it. Um, and this is kind of where the diocese office is. We saw a bunch of kids chasing geese. You can hit it again. And uh, maybe some of you remember this guy, um, uh, Pastor El Bariki Kaya. Um, he came to visit. Um, that's him in the red. And then Benson was here last. Um, he came to visit as well. Benson is the compassion coordinator at Singisi. But we went to visit Pastor uh, Kaya over at the, he now works at the Rehabilitation Center, where they um, help amputees with getting new prosthetics. They help um, uh, just all sorts of things. They even have training and uh, they have a new bakery. You can see some of the treats that come out of it. They train people in um, getting uh, careers and help them to uh, raise some money for them, their own families. You can hit it again. Um, we also, you can do one more. Uh, we also went to uh, one of the, um, they call it a junior seminary, but it's essentially a, a, a Christian high school is essentially what it is. Ilanga uh, Junior Seminary. Uh, and that's um, right near where one of the uh, national parks is that we went through, um, Arusha National Park. So we visited the school. You can hit it. You can see some of the uh, buildings that they have. And Pastor Elias accompanied us on um, several of these days, um, meeting the kids, um, hit it again, um, seeing their classrooms and uh, kind of the areas. Where they um, where they learn. This is considered one of the better schools in the area. So um, to get into it is a little bit more money. It's run by the church, um, but uh, the kids um, all pass their exams. One interesting note that we've learned when um, when we've met with them is uh, they have uh, an exam for each section that they move up to. So. You know, when you're a freshman, you take an exam to get into, for example, ninth grade, and then you take another exam two years later to get into junior, uh, to become a junior. We'll call it that. They have different names for it. But literally, if you do not pass, your education is done. You don't get a second chance. So it's that important. When they take the, and it's, it's not like the boards where you can take them again and again and again until you finally get it right, or any of our exams here. It's when you're done, if you don't pass, you're done and your schooling stops at whatever test you fail. So it's extremely important. The kids in that school all pass, which is interesting because they all um, are taught in that way and, and really work that hard, so it's a great thing. Um, we also went out, I'm not gonna talk about the side, that's for somebody else, you can go for it further. Um, we also visited Mungaza Education Center, which is a teacher's college. Um, uh, they are located in Arusha and do a fabulous job of teaching teachers. That was one of the other things we went. And also to a, um, one of my favorite pictures, um, Gretchen meeting one of the pigs. Um, and uh, we, uh, they do a lot of teaching of um, chefs and hotel industry. There's a lot of um, teaching of support work in the community. Where is the money in the community that they can make jobs, get good jobs, it's in hotels, it's in it's in tourism and things like that. So um, the people that are doing really well are the, the tour directors. Um, so, And um, we also had the great privilege of going to the Synod Assembly at the end of, we were the honored guests of the bishop at the Synod Assembly. Um, and it was a great privilege, although um, 
if you've ever sat through an eight hour meeting where you can't understand what they're saying, you start to feel a little differently about it. <laughs> so it was a great privilege. And we got goats. We got three goats at the end, so that was that was a treat. Um, we can go on. And that's that's uh this is a uh, the Singisi leaders with us at the diocese. So uh, I think it's um, we can we can go past these. These are some shots at one of the one of the marketplaces. Yeah, one more. So I'm gonna call upon the inscription for the compassion. So in some ways to call one day a compassion day sounds a little bit misleading and the reason we titled it that is because it has to do with Compassion International. But actually it's a component of this whole trip on both sides. And it's just a wonderful way to live out that sense of compassion and interacting with other people. But Singizi is a center for Compassion International, and those of you who met Benson um, probably knew that about him. He's the director of the Compassion International School at Singizi. So on Saturday, kids who are sponsored through the Compassion International Pro um, program come into Singizi, and they do essentially Sunday school with them, feed them a meal all day long. And so we thought, well, why don't we bring a few activities for the kids, which became kind of a bigger production, and we decided, first we thought we'd make tie-dye shirts, but then we decided that would be too difficult. So we, um, we were making shirts with Sharpies and isopropyl alcohol. Getting the isopropyl alcohol in, in Tanzania turned out to be quite an odyssey in itself. But the wonderful thing was just seeing these kids take to these crafts. We did bracelets, we had bubbles, we had balloons. We had all kinds of things that we would do in a typical VBS. And these are not experiences that are often available to these kids, and they just thrived. They just loved it. And um, by the end of the day, Benson looked at us and he said, this was really, this was fun. Not just fun, this was really fun. And someone else said to us too that the kids don't often spend this kind of time playing with with adults, especially that playing isn't something that's necessarily part of their life. So it's just a really uplifting day. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to four of the young men who were there, maybe 20-ish age men, and they just asked me for probably an hour and a half straight questions about America. And I'm just going to pose one to you and let you think about it. One of them they asked me, I think this was the hardest one, was, what do Americans think of us? It was a challenging question to answer. Because you think of the stereotypes we sometimes hold of poor African children or uneducated or whatever. So it was just a really good time for exchange. And I, probably other people might have a couple comments to say about that day. Question. I just wanted to ask a question to kind of follow up on what Darla said. Uh, she spoke about uh, families dedicating their oldest child to the church. Mm -hmm. What exactly do they mean by that? Did you get an answer from Elias in that? I thought it was a presentation. It was a, it was a new practice they were trying, um, but it was the idea of um, dedicating your children to God's work, to, to the ministry. To a lifetime of, of service, not necessarily the ministry or that? No, it was more just the sense of thankful, thankfulness to God for their child and, and giving thanks and kind of giving back with them, you know, so they received the child and they gave them right back, obviously. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was something new to, to them even, so it was kind of an interesting uh, exchange. And Elias was even trying to explain it, you know, as it was going on, and, you know, what does this all mean? And, but, yeah. So it, was, it kind of went along with Isaac and Abraham. Um, Almost the presentation of Jesus in the temple. Right, in the presentation of Jesus in the temple and things like that. Samuel. Yeah, Samuel in the temple. Farmer, farmer's daughter gets to talk about cows. Uh, two, two of the projects that uh, St. Matthew's has been involved with in the past. One is providing cows for families, and the second is biogas chambers. Now let's put in, in perspective where Singizi is. It's in northern Tanzania. To the east is uh, Moshi, and a very arid area. 
to the west is Arusha, the second largest city, and it's arid on the other side of Arusha. And in between is the upslopes of Mount Meru. So where Singizi is, they have a lot of lush greenery. We have, they have banana trees, they have coffee plants, they grow their own vegetables. But that's a very limited diet. So they came to us they, a few years back and they talked about wanting cows. St. Matthew sponsored 140 cows, or cows for 140 families, which means a family got one cow. Of those cows that came to those families, the first calf was given to the church, and the church could decide where it wanted to put it. The second calf that was born went, had to be given to another family from the family that received the cow originally. And the third calf was the first one that they would be able to keep. So it'd be about five years before they would ever be able to keep their own calf. But we have cows all over the place. In fact, when we went this time, they told us no more cows. We've got enough cows. We're, we've got a great group of cows coming up. We have our own, our own supply of cows. Part of the problem is that they also have their own supply of cow dung. And the question became what to do with that. And a few years back, the discussion started again with St. Matthews about biogas chambers in which they take a slurry of the cow dung, they let it cook, it creates methane, they pipe that off into their outdoor kitchen and they use it for cooking. And we saw two of the four um, biogas chambers that have been put in. Absolutely amazing. I was raised on the farm. Cow dung was something we spread on the fields. We would never have thought about using that for energy. But it is very successful. The women, the, of the household that we were talking to, we said, okay, how does this change your life? And they said, number one, I don't have to buy wood, and wood is scarce. Number two, I have instant heat. I have instant cooking. You know, we think instant cooking, you put it in a microwave, you zap it. But for them, instant cooking is immediate heat. They don't have to stoke a fire. They don't have to use bottled gas, which is very expensive. They don't have to use electricity, which only about 30% of Tanzania has access to and what they have access to isn't very stable and it's also very expensive so it's it's one of the things that they can do and get instant heat and also on this trip the lord was working he took the farmer's daughter and put her in a household in which the head of the household has been dealing with the issue of what do we do with the milk you know we now have milk that we can sell and trade and everything else but what else can we do with it to keep it and they have started a dairy in which they are making yogurt Land O'Lakes was there a few years ago, gave them a uh, generator and also a butter insurance so they could do yogurt, drinking yogurt, real yogurt, and butter. And he looked at me and he goes, I really would love to do cheese. I need somebody to come over here and teach me how to make cheese. By the way, I have a cousin who was the head che master cheese maker at Land O'Lakes, just retired. Fired off an email to him saying, Laverne, I know you love the animals, I know you love to do all this type of stuff. Here's the, the situation. His comment was, I always wanted to do development work with our development arm. I never had a chance to because I was always out in California fixing their cheese plants. So my, ne my cousin is now working with Ishmael and trying to get the cheese operation started in San Giusi. I tell you, it's, it's amazing how God puts you together at the right time. It was just a, a little off-the-cuff conversation that started one night at, um, after dinner, and I think it's got a great potential, and I'm praying that it turns out in the future. I'll do that, Chris. Okay, I need to go upstairs to. You need to preach. Another activity. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we've sponsored students through St. Easy since the first trip to Tanzania. And um, currently, I have about 23 students that we sponsor. But it's been more and more difficult for us at St. Matthew's to keep that fund active and alive. And I think all of you just recently received a letter from us um, about, about trying to make that a priority for us. We sponsor, the way this Tanzanian school system works is that primary education is paid for by the government. It doesn't cover supplies, basic, you know, pens, pencils, um, paper, sometimes uniforms. Those supplies aren't covered, so that's still a burden for some families. But once you get past um, primary education, the costs aren't covered at all, and it becomes 
um, actually just prohibitive for some families. So we have asked for the last three or four years when we have spoken to their partnership committee, they have said their priority amidst all of their needs, and this is a country where, where many people aren't, don't have electricity, many people don't have clean water, many people are lacking in what we consider just everyday basics that we don't even think of, and they are saying our priority is in education. We want to be able to send more of our students on to high school, to secondary school, because that gives them a chance to test into the university and to actually become professional and support the community in that way. So that was, how many times have you been on a committee where there's a unanimous decision? Unanimous decision of their partnership committee for several years. So we've made that a huge priority. Um, we were able to visit two of the students who have been sponsored through St. Matthews. And I think it's important to understand the difference in educational systems. We tend to compare our high school students to their high school students. But you need to understand that the kids there who are in high school have tested. Our kids all have the assumption that they're gonna go so they can go, I don't wanna do my homework, or this class is boring. Sometimes I hear that. Um, but these kids are, know that they are lucky to be there, that this is a privilege that not other kids have. So they're very, more, very motivated. And we were able to meet with um, two of them. One was named Agnes, and we asked her if she had any messages for our kids here, and she said, I would tell them to work hard and pray hard. And her whole family met with us and told us how grateful they were to the support St. Matthews has given them to allow her to finish that education. And then we met with Robinson, who um, was a 17-year-old boy, right there, who was extremely poised and articulate. He wants to be a doctor. Um, he said his nickname is the teacher. And then he said to us the poem that we put, actually I think it was poetic, um, that we put in the letter, water, rivers don't drink their own water, trees don't eat their own fruit, we are like nature, we live for others. It was just so profound and so simple and so beautiful. But again, it was an expression of the importance of education, just that, that internal knowledge of how important it is. So um, I guess I'm kind of making a pitch in this room too to follow up the pitch of our letter, but. It is so important and it's something that we don't think of in those terms because for us when we think about education expenses, we're thinking about college. And even then we have the ability to get loans and you know, most of our kids are in the position to pay back those loans, but it's not the case in Tanzania. So if you're interested in helping sponsor um, a, a student, please talk to either Darla, me, Pat, Kelly, or Pastor Chris. Any questions about from Do you match up, let's say, a person from this congregation with the students specifically? Well, we hope to be able to do that, but the way that they've decided to distribute the money in Tanzania is that they would like to have enough money from us to support 25 students, and then they will look at all of their students who would be eligible and almost have an application process and decide which families they give it to based on which students will succeed. So they're open to doing a one-to-one, -one, but that is a, another administrative step, and it um, might not work in terms of how we're collecting money for this fund either, because some people might be able to pledge 200 um, rather than you know 500 for five years. So we will have the names and pictures and information about the 25 students we sponsor. And we will have some communication from them, but whether it will be one-to-one -one is still being discussed. Any other questions? Good morning. Uh, I'm Pat. Uh, uh, it's really my pleasure to speak to, to, I think, what was for all of us one of our two favorite days. Uh, the first was probably the Compassion International Saturday with the kids, which was just a joy to, to participate in. Um, the second was an experience we had at Ngarnuki uh, um, and Ngaranga. So Ngaranga is a Lutheran hospital that we'll get to second. This is Ngarnuki, um, and this is a village that's really the outskirts um, in the Sigizi area. Darla spoke to Sigizi, the very lush banana plantation at the base of Mount Meru. Um, kind of the opposite here, very barren, an area that's developing a number of new homes going up. It's a place that um, 
people there can actually go and get property and, and have a home, but it's definitely on the outskirts. Um, and one of the other things you'll notice in, in Tanzania is that uh, the mode of transportation uh, is a little bit different than we have here. There's a lot of motorbikes in the younger generation, but just about everybody else is walking, and walking far distances. Um, and Garanuki is about um, probably a good half an hour or more a car ride or Land Rover ride from the City Easy area. So the people are walking an enormous distance to get to any kind of medical care facility. This is what you consider a clinic here. It's a pretty small area. Um, there's one physician there who's just graduated from medical school. He's pretty much there by himself providing care. He can do some basic, very basic surgery, kind of suturing of wounds, um, delivery of babies. And when we spoke to him, he had a very nice presentation for us of their needs and what their uh, practice was at Garanuki. And what they really need is a bathroom. Um, for the maternal care there, they don't even have toilet facilities. So where we are out here, pretty much any kind of restroom facility is a squat toilet on the ground. So their need is a basic bathroom just to be able to provide hygiene for women prepartum and during delivery and, and antepartum. So um, some real basic needs from a care standpoint. And it was really just amazing the amount of care that they're providing there with nothing. They don't have a pharmacy out here. They don't have medicines. They have very, very basic supplies um, and are doing really, really great work with what they have. This was kind of halfway between um, Singizi and the Maasai village that we went to, so quite a distance. The second place yeah. thing we did was the uh, eyeglass prep. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. This is another little farm. Do you remember the cost of doing the bathroom? Was it about $1,500? $1, $1,500. So that was another thing that we thought we could raise up at this meeting, that that would be, we asked for a list of possible projects for us to support, and we thought the bathroom's pretty basic, because those of you who have given birth, mm -hmm. I think would understand how much you would prefer to have a bathroom. The partnership committee kind of told us their four biggest priorities, the first which was education, but this was kind of one of those almost a no-brainer, wow, we could do this for a relatively small amount of money and make an enormous difference in it in the practice and the lives of women there. So yeah, thank you. So if you're interested, we talk with them as well. And Karenga is a Lutheran hospital that's, uh, again, a relatively short car distance from the village of Singizi and the church, but not uh, all that easy of a walk. Um, there are government hospitals. There's a government hospital in Arusha. That's a very long walk for anybody living in the Singizi area to walk to. And this is really providing some of the basic care in the area. They have an orphanage there, they do surgery there. There's about five physicians who are practicing there, one of whom uh, was trained in orthopedic surgery, Dr. Kiwesa. Uh, he's the only person there doing that type of surgery. And unfortunately, most of the surgery he's doing are amputations. The number of motorcycles that are used for motor transportation there um, are resulting in an awful lot of accidents and, and many, many amputations. So that's unfortunately how he's spending uh, most of his time. But they do have a surgeon there and uh, five doctors. Uh, Dr. Frank, who Chris and I stayed with first, is a dentist. Um, he's also practicing at that hospital. Dentistry is Dr. Frank. There's no hygienist, there's no assistant. Um, there's one chair that kind of looks like what you think of if you went to the dentist maybe in like 1970. So um, again, doing a lot with some very basic uh, supplies. Dr. Frank's also the radiologist because dentists read x-rays. He also reads the bone x-rays. So, what we did there was an eyeglass project. Um, Lynn Hooper is a congregant with uh, Pastor Patoy in Racine at Redeemer, and she was kind of the traveling optometry show. She had uh, everything we needed to uh, make eyeglasses. So we broke up into teams. Gretchen and I did some basic eye exams, distance, distance uh, vision, near vision. Chris and Darla put together uh, eyeglasses, um, and Kelly really made sure that the eyeglasses that we made actually worked um, for the uh, people at the hospital once they were put together. We got there in the morning um, pretty early and there was already a very deep line of people waiting to be seen. We had a small tour of the facility and by the time we got back, there were more people to be seen. We only took a break during the day because Dr. Kiwesa had wanted to meet with us and have lunch um, and he was waiting for us to lunch with him so he could get back to the operating room. Otherwise, I don't think any of us would have even taken a break because there were so many people to service that we worked straight through um, till dark. We made about uh, 175 pair of glasses and did roughly 200 eye exams during that day. We were really fortunate that we had a Tanzanian optometrist with us because there were a number of patients that Fretch and I kind of very early realized that this was way beyond our level of ability to, uh, to deal with and they had more than just vision needs. Um, but it was really a very rewarding experience. We had them um, reading in Swahili um, for a distance and near and just to see the, the look on their faces when you actually put a corrective lens in front of their eye and they could all of a sudden read. Um, was just unbelievably rewarding. So 
a great day, really, really nice service project for us to do, and I think something that is probably going to be incorporated <coughs> into the, uh, the Mission Dallas Alvin work, too. Yeah? Um, I know that we also sent along over-the-counter medications. Were those two the places where you gave them? Or? So the uh, in Karenga, um, the hospital, the pharmacy is basically two short, two small shelves, two walls of medicines. That's for the entire hospital. We took them two suitcases full of antibiotics. They told us what they needed was primarily antibiotics. The dispensary um, really doesn't have any medicines there, so one of the goals for us was to kind of try and push the, uh, the Senate to share some of that with the dispensary as well. Right now, most of that goes to the hospital. So yeah, we took about as much as we could carry in the suitcases, um, and they were very, very happy to have that gallon. One thing I noticed about the people who visited us from Tanzania was that their teeth were really bad. So it's and uh, what causes that? And, and with one dentist, how in the world can they deal with what they've got to deal with? Yeah, unfortunately, it's actually their water supply. So the, the fluoride content in, the, in their water is about five times what we have here, and it actually turns their teeth that color. And we notice a number of people don't have that who are, aren't drinking the basic groundwater supply, but it's the water. And yeah, their teeth get very brown very early and have brown lines. Um, even, you'll notice the children, there were kind of two populations of kids, some who had that, that type of teeth and those who didn't. So it's unfortunately just for water. And they just want, thank you. I just wanted to end to let you know that um, Pastor Chris gets razzed a lot for taking photos, but <laughs> I tried to keep up with him so that we have some pictures <laughs> of Pastor Chris, so it actually looks like he's in some of the photos. <laughs> thank you. One of the first things we did when we got there was to drive out to the Maasai village, which was quite remote, and um, really is what you probably have as your stereotypical thought of what it looks like to be in Africa. They still live very much as they've been living for hundreds of years. They wrap themselves in that bright plaid clothing that makes you question whether they somehow have some ancestral relationship with the Scots. But um, it's all very bright and, and plaid, and um, they still dress that way. They wear the huge beaded collars. A lot of the beadwork you see on the table is their handiwork. Um, they have a Lutheran church there, so we sat and had a little meeting in the Lutheran church and ex exchanged information about how we do things. And then they took us, um, we, made, we had friendship bracelets. We made about a thousand friendship bracelets in VBS, and so we gave a lot of those out there which was pretty popular. Um, the pastor looks a little stern. I, did anyone see him smile? No. So, I mean, he was interesting, but, um, but so it was a very interesting meeting, and then they took us back and this, to this little tent they had set up with a partition of a blue plastic tarp, and that's where we had our first goat. Um, and I will tell you that it was a little bit unsettling we did not see the goat. We saw someone walk behind the blue tarp carrying a machete type knife and then they brought out little slices of meat on toothpicks. So, um, but it was a huge honor in some ways. I think that goat was um, the biggest honor we had because it was in such humble surroundings. And then they had set out all of their wares for us to look at and buy. And, um, it did get a little a little aggressive, but uh, <laughs> well, the women made the things and were sitting there displaying them, and then there were guys hanging around, and we were never certain whether the men were actually working for the women or in spite of the women. They were clearly sharing profits, and the men were very aggressively selling, but we were kind of wondering, you know, was this a setup beforehand, or I don't know, it was interesting. So it was very interesting visit, very authentic. Um, we also visited another Maasai village that has um, actually decided they, they still live in huts like this and we, we visited a village where we were actually able to go into the huts and that village is actually making um, a living or making part of a living by charging people like us to come through their village. Which it's a little, for me it was an uncomfortable feeling, um, but it was their choice to do it so we actually sat in a hut. Um, Darla and I were in the same hut, and it's very close and dark, and they have a cooking fire in the middle of it. And it was very interesting. Still, you see the Maasai dressed like that often in the city. You will see them walking around with cell phones dressed like that. I mean, I'm, 
That's one thing that I, I can't remember. I think it's about 70% or more of the population does have cell phones, even though they don't have electricity or water and things like that. So, Eventually, a young man gave a ride to. Oh, right. Yeah, we were um, when we visited the Maasai. Suddenly, we came back and there was one a, a man that on the bus that we didn't know, and Pastor Elias had invited him. He had dinner with us, and he he was kind of quiet. Um, we weren't entirely sure why he was there, but he had needed a ride, and so Elias offered him a ride. And this is, I mean, I think this is one of the. I mean, this is one of the amazing witnesses to faith that we experienced there, because Elias said, sometimes people treat the Messiah like they're not good enough, like they're outsiders. So I wanted to let him know we're not like that. That's why I invited him. And so then at the, at the table, it was suggested that we sing a hymn for grace, and that man, that Messiah man, just belted it out at the top of his lungs by memory. So it was just, it was really a humbling and and just a really faithful moment. If they have cell phones, do they have satellite dishes too? Um, so, I think yes. some of the homes yes. we if did they have satellite, satellite dishes, dishes. dishes. Yeah. But you have to understand, a lot of them don't have electric. I mean, even when we stayed in a guest, they had a guest house, and I think they were fairly well off. They were certainly middle class, and they work very hard to conserve their electricity About because it's so expensive. The Probably about how much? About 30% of the country doesn't have electricity. No, it's about 70% doesn't. 35% 30, has electricity. Has electricity. Yeah. Has yeah. Elect, yeah. And the people, and even the people who have it, conserve it. You know, they, the woman where we stayed and they had electricity, she still cooked on a fire in the backyard because the electricity was too expensive. How do they charge their... Solar. Oh, phones? How do, how do they charge them? Their phones? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question, Myron. Solar data? I don't know. They have solar, or they actually have shops where you go and, and charge. Yeah. They're, they're charging shops. It's really charge. Interesting. It's almost, you know, it's almost a more reliable way for us to communicate with them by texting than email um, or Facebook, they even because the access to the internet is somewhat spotty, or they may have to go a ways to get it. Brenda, with the side village. With the Lutheran Church in the village, did that mean that specific village was all Lutheran, and did that mean that they then followed Christian practices rather than some of the traditional Messiah practices, like more than one wife and those kinds of things? Um, I, I'm not sure that anyone in this room can answer that with authority. But I do know it was the only church there. There's a strong Lutheran influence. I'm not entirely sure how many tribes still have multiple wives. I think we all know Pastor Elias's father had seven wives, I believe. But I think with each generation, that's fewer and fewer people. So we certainly didn't ask those questions when we were you know, sitting in the church, but um, it's hard to know because often the the village that you see isn't doesn't reflect their whole population because they're out taking care of cows, especially the men and the boys. So, you know, it's hard to know how many of them we actually, how how much of their whole village we saw. Because in Kenya, because I've visited several different Maasai villages, and the ones I visited still have a lot of those traditional values that the more than one wife was one, um, and. The, we had a long discussion with a guy this summer because he was Maasai, but he was also Christian. But it also sounded like at least the villages there are quite small, and when you reach adulthood, you go and establish another village someplace else. We didn't have those kinds of intense conversations with the Maasai, but this would be a good segue into our next topic, actually. We had a driver on our safaris named Alex. And he actually was Maasai by birth, but he lived in Arusha. And his wife had another tribal background. I don't remember what her background was. But there is a Maasai Lutheran church in Arusha, and he attended that church just to keep the tradition alive. He didn't dress like that. He dressed in a Western manner. But I, I mean, I think it's important to a lot of people to keep those tribal t traditions. And there was alive actually well. a split in the Lutheran church in Tanzania several years ago about whether or not the Lutheran Church would maintain just a single marriage or if they would encompass some of the Maasai traditions. 
And essentially what it turned out is that the two groups split. The Lutheran Church is very, very strong. The Messiah-based one is very small. Yeah. And that's another interesting thing in Tanzania, um, especially from the perspective of someone who's been to El Salvador so much. The Lutheran Church in Tanzania is huge. I mean, just in terms of area and people it covers and their structures, it's just, it, that was amazing to me. Did you have a question? I was wondering about the language. What, what language are the classes taught in? What language do people so, know you use? Everybody has a tribal language. The, the Maasai speak Ki Maasai, Pastor Elias speaks Kimeru. So depending on their tribe, that is their, na their so-called native language, the language that they're born into and, and speak. And then the national language is Swahili, Kiswahili. Um, so everybody speaks Kiswahili. And then they began learning English in, I believe, it's seventh grade. At one, it becomes mandatory, and I, I might be wrong on the grade, it might be a little bit sooner than that. But they do start learning English. So most of the adult population, if they've been through at least part of high school or you know, the beginning stages of secondary, speaks some English but their national language is Kiswahili. So we all learned a little bit of it. Habariya Asabui means how are you this morning? And you just say, huh? And you say, Missouri, good. Okay, last thing is um, safaris. And I'm just gonna quickly say we saw a lot of animals. Um, <laughs> Pastor Chris said, every, I swear every like half an hour, it's like, I've never seen this many. I've never, I've never seen. So um, we had a couple of interesting experiences. We got charged by an elephant. I think she was tired of a couple of photographers taking multiple pictures of her baby who was just hours old, we were told. I mean, it was the cutest little baby. It was like this big. It was so cute. And it didn't know how to use its trunk, so it kind of like put its trunk up and then its trunk would just fall down. And the driver said it was probably hours old. So we saw like multiple herds of elephants with babies. And um, she, so the mother started to walk across the, the road and you know, it was a great photo op to get close-ups of her and she kind of walked across and pretty soon we realized she was picking up speed and then her ears were flapping and then dust was flying. So. That Chris, turned, Chris turned into a soprano when he was there. I was going to spare him that embarrassment, but this is true. So we escaped, though. We're all fine. That's what Karen Gary did before I said that. Well, good job. Pat got it all on film. So, yes, he did. Yes. So that was interesting. I mean, talk about being up close. I mean, it got to the point where seeing baboons was routine. You know, something oh, like, oh, there's more, there's a hundred more baboons, big deal. It was baboons, you know, and baby baboons, they're so cute. Um, and see, I mean, just everything, we just saw a ton of animals. And the other thing is, we got very, very close to a lion. We hadn't seen many lions except from afar, and then there, we, we found a bunch of jeeps pulled over, and the lion got up and walked pretty close to our jeep, and then went and settled next to another one. So. That was interesting. I'm looking at your picture of the rhinoceros, is it? Those are hippos. Oh, those are hippos. 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 Oh, that's it. We, do you remember a few years ago we had somebody who had spent considerable time in Africa and he said, I remember him t speaking about hippos and rhinoceros in particular, saying, if you ever want to know if God has a sense of humor, look <laughs> <laughs> Well, they look like so, they just look so calm and indolent, but they actually will kill you if they're hungry. So <laughs> who knows? Don't judge a book by its cover, I guess. So does anyone else have anything to add to the safari part? Pat documented quite a bit of it. It was a fabulous experience. Would you do it again? Oh, yes. absolutely. In a minute. And I, all five of us, I think, would say yes, absolutely. And you know, and I, I was, um, I'll, some of you have heard the stories of the first visits, and or have been on the first visits, and you know, it is, it's a little unsettling. You think, can is this going to be too hard for me? Can I do this? But really, it was. I've had harder trips to El Salvador, and I think you should all come to El Salvador too. So don't be right here. But, um, but really, it was a wonderful trip, and. The, the thing that's so important about partnerships is the relationship. 
And to be able to go back and visit them on their turf and visit their homes when we have been the host constantly to give them a, a, a chance to be the host was, it, I can't tell you how much that shores up a partnership, how, how exciting that is to see them there. So yes, absolutely, I would do it again. We all said that. We all we all said that the day we came home. So it didn't even take us time to come to that. In fact, it got up, got to the point on safari when there were so many people, so many Europeans or Americans around. It was like we need to get back to Singizi. We need to go back and be be immersed back into the culture because the safaris were wonderful, <coughs> but people who go there just for the safaris don't know Tanzania. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I think that would be, um, I think all of us would agree that the high, if we had to choose a high point to our trip, it would have been an experience in Singizi or with our partners. So it's, it's very, it's very mind opening and eye opening and heart opening. So, any other questions? Well, thank you for being very patient. <laughs> And captive audience to come down and vote on the building thing and listen to our story. So thank you so much. <laughs>